Live from our studios here at Adesawa in Kandakra, this is News at 10 on TV3, also live on DSTV channel 279 and on 3FM 92.7. We're interactive on our various social media platforms on Facebook at 3FM TV3 Ghana, Twitter TV3 Ghana and Instagram is TV3 Ghana. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari and it's good to have you join me tonight. Let's take a look at the major news highlights for today. We'll bring you the highlights now, but Parliament is debating the AGM Petroleum Agreement and Energy Minister John Peter Amel is currently on the floor. Let's go there and listen to him. Capturing those improvements, as this Honourable House has decided upon. Upon that, Honourable Minister, you may move for the adoption of a resolution. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that. The resolution number 22 on page 14 of today's order paper be adopted subject to the committee's recommendations made by the committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Seconded by Vice President Speaker. I write to second. Honorable members, the resolution has been duly moved and seconded. All those in favor of the resolution say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The resolution is duly adopted. Honorable leaders, just in case there is any issue, Honorable Majority Leader, any issue? Mr. Speaker, I believe we have come to the end of the business for the day. Also. Also. Thank and you very much, Honorable Majority Leader. We can Honorable conclude, Majority Leader, any issue? Concluding remarks. Honorable Majority Leader, any particular issue? Honorable Minority Leader, any particular issue? So the AGM Petroleum Agreement has finally been passed in Parliament and this means that GNPC's stake there has reduced to now 10%. But let's go back and look at how the debate went in Parliament. We extensively discussed it and we saw that the ministry did a good work by extending the, the state of the nation from the 10% carried interest to 15% carried interest. Mr. Speaker, we realized that that was a good call by moving from 10% carried interest to 15% carried interest. Mr. Speaker, another aspect is the local content. Mr. Speaker, it was 2.5%. Now, the state of Ghana, as far as local content is concerned, is 5%, Mr. Speaker, and that needs to be applauded. And Mr. Speaker, going through the report, we've also realized that the block in itself was an idle block, and exposing GMPC, and that, for that matter, Escroco to that 24%, was going to, in future, not going to help. First and foremost, I want to put on record that the committee never agreed on consensus. And I stand by that. We never agreed on any consensus. And therefore, I want the council to capture it clearly. Mr. Speaker, we disagreed. We disagreed with this agreement based on one, Article 20, that require for materiality to require for renegotiation is not sufficient in this matter. If somebody has acquired his block and want to now acquire a, do exploration on AGM to create an integration that's not amount to sufficient condition for renegotiation. And that is why in June 2008, 
when Honorable Aja, who was in, the, in office as the Minister for Energy, he used this to reject any attempt for any renegotiation. Mr. Speaker, we have a lot. GMPC has a mission of being stand alone operator in five years and world-class international oil company in 50 years. To achieve this, you must take certain steps, bold steps. Mr. Speaker, you must take certain decisions, take certain risks to be able to attain that decision. In every risk, there is benefit attached. So if you just tuned in, this is News at 10 on TV3 and 3FM and Parliament has passed the AGM Petroleum Agreement which means that GMPC's stake in the AGM Agreement has reduced from 43 to 18%. Let's stay a while longer on this and speak with energy expert Kojo Nsafwa Poku who is joining me on the phone lines. Good evening to you, Sam. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening and good evening to your viewers. So, Kojo, for someone who does not get the terms and figures thrown around uh, this debate and discussion, what are the five basic facts of the AGM agreement? Well, you see, let me say it this way. If you look at the physical policies, when you remember some weeks ago, Imani came up and said that if an old agreement exists and anybody wants to come in and do something else and it's an exploration that is to be done, you need to take it back to Parliament for Parliament to basically align that with the Act 919, and which is what the government is seeking to do. The old agreement which AGM had was under the old PNDC Law 84, which only gave government a 10% carried interest and also made sure that some of the royalties and the rate of return in terms of where, how we recover our money was much lower. The government went to parliament to align the new AGM with a care agreement with the Act 919, which gives government a carried interest of 15% instead of 10% from the old one, and also seek to now give us, a, if we are to make a discovery, we can now exercise further percentage in terms of how my government want to um, be carried. In that terms, it is good. You see that this agreement between the NDC and the MPP is a bit more philosophical. Let me explain. You have the NDC that is saying that Estoco, which is a company that was formed during the NDC time and the GMPC, Estoco was formed to basically take commercial interest in every block that the government is doing. Bear in mind, government gets a 15% carried interest. What that means is that with that 15%, government doesn't pay anything during exploration. So whether the company finds oil or doesn't find oil, we do not pay okay. any money towards the cost of the exploration. Mm. But what Estroco does, which is the 24% that everybody keeps talking about, Estroco takes 24%. And when there is a work program of about $239 million, as local 24% will be about $57 million, which Ghana government will have to pay. Now, GM, uh, GMPC, through its budget, has to go to parliament and ask government, which is from the consolidated fund, to make these monies available for the exploration. NPC believes that it is worth Ghana spending Let's say the 24% of $239 million is, let's say, $57 million. NDC believes that if you spend that $57 million and there is a discovery, you 24% will be worth billions. So that Ghana government will now have 24% more of the oil fight. MPP thinks that there is no need to expose the government carpet to such a risk, whereby you go and take $57 million of government's money to go and do exploration, and if you do not find anything, it means that you have wasted 57 million of Ghanaians' money. Mm. The two parties have different philosophical approach. Mm. Let's look at the history. During Honorable Tanjikate's time when he was head of GMPC, you realize that Ghana went alone and bought all these rigs and spent all this money. So the NDC has always believed that they want to now uh, put Ghana a bit more in 
more like spend money or risk to gain. The MPP came and said, look, we don't want to do this. And they now gave the blocks to the likes of Tulu and the EO groups and the discoveries were made coming forward. Then NDC came back and formed uh, Escroco, which seeks to basically do commercial activities. The two parties, one believes that GMPC should do commercial activities and use Ghanaians' money to basically risk. The other party doesn't believe that. So I honestly don't think that it's about somebody wrong or right. Okay. It is really about each party and their philosophy. One party believes that Ghana should risk money and maybe make more money. One party believes that there's no point risking the money. Let's stick to the 15% we have and collect taxes and royalties. So, so Kajo, we, we know that as part of the mission of the GNPC, it is supposed to be an autonomous body when it comes to oil drilling and, and that area. Shouldn't we then allow the GNPC to go ahead and do the investment as far as the drilling is concerned? Then we say that well, we don't want to I risk it, and so we're conserving or just staying with the 15% that we have. Well, my dear, that is a conversation as a nation we need to have. What, what I will suggest is that, look, GMPC is still a corporation. It was set up by an act of parliament. If government feels that they want GMPC to become a national oil company, go into the international market and be able to borrow money and take some of these risks, it can't be with our taxes and our uh, Ghana, our uh, no Kobe bill money that we don't have. I think the right thing to do is to make a GMPC a limited liability company. So GMPC will have to go from a corporation to a limited liability company so that government does not, they don't have to go to parliament to justify their investment, why they, are, they need government to give them a certain budget. Then what GMPC can do as a limited liability company mm. can now risk money they raise on the international market. Okay. So I would, for once, list GMPC on maybe the New York Stock Market or the London Stock Exchange or in, what, or in the Ghana Stock Exchange to be able to raise money. And with that money GMPC raise, they mm. can now uh, do some of these ventures of taking 24%, which is a commercial uh, interest. Okay. Where if there's a work program of 239 million, GMPC cannot come up with 67 million and risk. Because if they go and they don't find anything in that world, that 67 million dollars is going All right, to be Kojo, I, I, I'll let you hold on for a while. Let's listen to the Deputy Energy Minister, Mohammed Amin Adam, who has also been talking about this agreement in Parliament. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the, the ADM block is the deepest offshore block in Ghana so far. And working in deep offshore block involves so much, requires so much money, requires technology. As we speak today, about 13 oil blocks that were awarded between 2013 and 2016. These blocks were owned by contractors expected to drill 14 wells. They were supposed to spend 890 million US dollars. Mr. Speaker, these blocks include the AGM block. And as I speak, Mr. Speaker, not a single well has been drilled. Not a single well has been drilled, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this means that the companies were not able to attract investment. They were not able to raise the funds to do the work that they were supposed to do under the contract. Mr. Speaker, if we have to provide incentives for a company that is ready to bring the investment, and as I speak to you, AGM is ready to start drilling next week, Mr. Speaker. That is a determination of a serious company that wants to work with Ghana to partner with us to increase our reserves and increase production in Ghana. Yes, Mr. Speaker, as I speak, Ghana is faced with the challenge of declining oil production. The drilling field in the next three years will enter its decline phase, which means that if we don't take care over the next six to ten years, we will not have an oil and gas industry. Therefore, it is imperative that we increase our reserve size, we increase our replacement ratio, 
and therefore bring new worlds into production. So that was Deputy Energy Minister Mohammed Amin Adams. Kojo, can you hear me if you're still on the line? Yes, I am still on the line. Yes, so I, I made you listen to the minister because of what he said at the latter part of his presentation on the fact that Ghana is currently experiencing some declines in our oil resources. And then in the next six to ten years, we might not have as much as we have now. And so government is trying to play it safe to just go in with the 10% that we have and not invest so much so that we don't get much at the end of the day. Do you think this is a valid argument or something we should be looking or standing on to make an argument in such an agreement? Okay, listen to this. The 15, he said that the 15%, because now what we are going to get is a current interest set. Let's look at the two periods that he is talking about. When we found oil in 2007 as a country and production started, until the ENI block made a discovery, we have not really made much discoveries since then. A lot of the blocks were given out in the last eight years during the NDC administration, including the AGM block in question. Mm -hmm. Most of the blocks that were given out during the NDC period most of them have not been able to carry out the work program that they were supposed to do, which is a fact. You know, I mean, that is not a lie. Now, every oil well has a period of about eight to ten years before the pressure in these wells goes down. Mm. What you might now have to do is basically pump in more gas to get more oil out, which then becomes expensive to extract the oil. So you give every well between eight to ten years. We've been extracting the Jubilee field since 2011, so we've gone about eight years in the Jubilee field. So Jubilee field will have about three years more left on that field. What it means is that we need to have a lot of our wells or a lot of our blocks bringing up a lot more oil. If not, we will have a period where we will not have a producing well. That is a fact. Whether, that's what I'm saying, whether the government wants to now have the commercial interest if you take out the physical policies, like I said earlier, the 15% carried interest, the rate of return, the royalties, this new deal is a good deal. The only disagreement between the NDC and the MPP is whether GMPC should be allowed to take commercial interest or not. For me, where I stand, I don't think Ghanaians listening to us this, more this evening are happy that we will want to risk up to about $50 million anytime we are part of a work program to go and drill a well. Mm. Look, let me say something. When Hess, Hess Petroleum was drilling the Akeh block, which Imani did the press conference with last year, before where, uh, Hess Petroleum found oil, they drilled five dry wells. What it means is that if each well cost two hundred million to drill, yeah. has spent one billion dollars before they found oil. Yeah. Now in that block, Ghana Esploku was to have ten percent of that block. If we had been paying that ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, Ghana will have lost hundred million dollars before the sixth well now strike oil. Is so, this the sort of operations that we want to do as a nation? Mm. I don't think it is right to use that the local BBO money we don't have to do that. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much, Kojo, for joining us. Kojo Nsafapoku is an energy expert who has been speaking to us on the fact that Parliament has passed the AGM Petroleum Agreement. You're watching News at 10 on TV3, which is also live on 3FM 92.7. We're back with more after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back from the break. This is News at 10 on TV3 and also on 3FM 92.7. The Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations have expressed satisfaction with the Ritz Junction footbridge in the Adenta municipality, but want city authorities to rid it of hawkers who they say obstruct their movement. According to the engineer Shamshu Dean Issa, the design is to make it accessible to all. A report by Wendy Lai and Elizabeth Osuachum. Series of road accidents have been recorded on this Medina Adentan stretch. Lives have been lost on this stretch as well. Last year there was an uproar and residents who live in this community 
called on government to construct the footbridges. Eventually, government heeded to their call and the contract was re-awarded. Right behind me is the Rees Junction footbridge, which also has ramps. We will be interacting with residents on their experience as they use this footbridge, as well as interact with members of the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations who are here to do their assessment. Elvis Kosi Alipui, Patience Atipoka Itwa, and Christopher Agbega are members of the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations. They are all physically challenged but have variations. Representing the organization, they wanted first-hand experience in accessing the Ritz Junction footbridge. The footbridge is about 65 meters long. From Adentan to Accra on the left side, it is 148 meters long and 138 meters on the right side. Being a person with disability, physical disability in the future, first time you use this a bridge and the, and the ramps is accessible to me personally. Everybody, like for everybody with a disability, you should be able to uh, use it. Unlike other places where you find uh, stairs and then it's difficult to use. But for me in particular too, I have an issue. The only issue I had is with the distance. It's quite a long distance. I, I, I don't see myself using this on a daily basis. But they had concerns. It will occupied by the hawkers. So we sincere have to look about all these things. Otherwise, it's accessible today. Tomorrow, it will not be accessible. Whatever you are want to do uh, suits the person with disability, we want to be involved at the early planning stage. That is our core. Can there be some supervision, at least? Someone should be here, you know, from time to time to make sure that we don't have pockets taking over the foot bridges. And then another concern to have with the metal railings is usually on a hot day like this, they are very hot. So it's very difficult, you know, it's, it's hot to, to, to touch. So I'm sure that there, 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 there's a way. I've seen something somewhere. It's more like a cushion like rubber. They wrap around the handle so you can hold and then use. Christopher Agbega was not able to walk the full length of the bridge. It's a motor, motor sensory neuropathy, and so it's more nervous. It's a nervous condition, and when it happens like that, normally when there's exhaustion, like when there's the sun is up and all of these other weather conditions, it tends to have its own effect on me. To that length, I think, yes, it is accessible. You could tell that it is lengthy, yes, but the length has to do with the universal design. Otherwise, if you are building the access, you are, if you are making it accessible, you are trying as much as possible to follow the measurements and not making it steep. If, if it was shorter, it would be steep and then we can't even access it. The assemblyman for the Adentan electoral area, Rashid Osei Bunsu, expressed satisfaction about the project but expects it to be fitted with lights. Myself and my brother, we used the pedestrian walkway, the bridge, and realized that there were some few issues. One, the lighting system. The whole place was dark. So it was a, a bit scary. Two, the rail, rails at the middle side, the guards, the metal guards, are too short. I was suggesting that at least uh, it should be at the shoulder level of an adult. Residents who also used the footbridge for the very first time shared their experience. Whether well, the distance is long, but it's cool with this. Uh, the battery stairs were just short for me, the, the upper stairs. I think is is the best is the best is the safest of all because when you see you crossing down, going up and down is the is very risky. Resident engineer in charge of the Medina Adentan access ramp to footbridges construction, Shamsuddin Isa, explained the specifications of the six foot bridges are the same, but the designs are different. When you go to a specific location, you look at what you have on the ground before you be able to tailor your design to suit into it. Out of the six foot bridges, the Race Junction footbridge is substantively complete. He indicated a number of factors were taken into consideration to arrive at the zigzag ramps. The zigzag is, um, if you are very familiar with the place, you realize that we have an intersection there. Uh, we, we cannot go into the intersection, so we had to turn it around. 
But when you turn around and come, the second flight, there's not enough clearance between the, the surface of the deck and the ramp. So we have to turn it around again. Going back, you meet the same intersection. Then we turn it around again. So that's the reason for the zigzag nature. He indicated that a 7% slope was used. The reason for the 7% slope is we want a, a structure whereby the disabled person in wheelchair will be able to wheel himself up and down without any assistance. We have a standard, a standard that meets their needs. We don't necessarily have to meet with them to understand their challenges. So we, where we know we want to design for them, we just follow the standard that is meant for them. Some other considerations were the availability of space and safety. The footbridges are at different levels of completion, but the stipulated time for completion is the end of May. All the footbridges have ramps, but four, namely Zongo Junction, Redco, SDA and Wasa Denton Barrier have stairs been constructed by six contractors. The estimated cost of each of the footbridges is six million cities. And that's how we wrap up News at 10. Thanks for staying with us. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. I am black and proud.